Thank you. And also, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, uh, the kind invitation to, to this conference. It's, it's a pleasure to be in Paris for a month, in the month of June. It's, it's really nice. Um, and the conference is also really nice. Uh, now, um, I'm going to talk about waterways. Um, most of my talk is going to be uh, about singularities and po some formation of um, singularities in this model. So I'm going to start with some more general, uh, some more general description of the problem in order to get um, so to understand better what the problem is. Um, also, Fabio Pusateri. So he uh, had. Uh, so I'm going to repeat a few things that Fabio discussed. Uh, um, uh, two days ago. Uh, so the model that you are looking at, at the simplest level, uh, the model is a model that uh, um, it's a model that has, uh, so it's simpler to draw a picture. So you have a fluid that presumably li uh, lives under an interface and the fluid is described by the interface. The interface is a moving surface Z of alpha and T and uh, it's described by a velocity, so V. And uh, we have um, uh, equations, and uh, inside the fluid, so it's a, uh, so we're looking at the free bound in incompressible Euler. Inside the fluid, we have the Euler equations. Uh, the material derivative of V is minus gradient of the pressure. And then we also have uh, the, uh, the gravity term minus GEN, so it's a gravity term pointing down. Uh, now, um, this is uh, inside the fluid, this is the equation for the uh, vorticity. However, uh, there's also an equation for uh, the moving interface. The interface is itself is moving, and uh, the interface is moving with the fluid, which says that dt of z, so the particle on this interface, if the velocity of the particle points in some direction, then the interface wants to move in the same direction. And uh, one can write this simply as saying that dt z minus uh, the velocity v would have to be tangent to the uh, graph to the graph of the interface. Um, now, in order to make this into a system and to, uh, to close the system, we need to prescribe something and we, uh, one can prescribe the, uh, the pressure on the interface and uh, the pressure on the interface would be prescribed, the simplest way is to prescribe it proportional to the uh, mean curvature of the interface. So P of X and T is sigma times kappa of X and T, where kappa is the mean curvature, as I said and sigma is a positive parameter. If one just looks at the system this way, even just making sense of what's the equation, so what evolves, there are several things that evolve, so making sense of the system, it takes a little bit of, uh, so one has to think for a minute. The way to look uh, naively is to, s to take the divergence and then uh, the first equation would say that one has an equation for delta of the pressure. So if you know the velocity at some point, at some time, uh, then we get an equation for delta of the pressure at that time and then the pressure is also prescribed on the bond. So in principle, we get the pressure at the time out of this information. Uh, and then once we have the pressure and the velocity and the interface at, the say, at one time, then we get the, uh, the infinitesimal increment. So we get from the equation Vt, the, for, from the Euler equation, we get what the increment is. Uh, there is a slight uh, uh, imprecision in the equation for z because one can think that the parameterize it has to do with how you parameterize the surface. There are many ways to parameterize the, sur the same surface and uh, that uh, there's a slight imprecision there. Uh, so this, are the, uh, this is the system now. Uh, one can raise like for any evolution. It turns out that uh, it turns out that one can make sense of it as a well-posed evolution system and uh, one can raise at least three basic questions like for any uh, system of this type, one would have the local regularity question, which is can we construct uh, solutions local in time? If one starts from nice initial data, can one construct solutions local in time? Uh, one can also uh, ask the question of global regularity, so can one construct solutions that extend for a long time, or even long-term regularity that goes beyond uh, the local existence time? And one can raise the question of dynamical formation of singularities, meaning starting with data that's nice at time zero, and at some point beyond the local regularity time, uh, one would form something that would look like a singularity in the flow. And um, I'm going to quickly describe, most of my talk is going to be about the last point, the issue of dynamical formation of singularities, but I'm going to describe quickly the other uh, pieces as well. And um, Fabio also described them 
uh, two days ago. Um, now, the local regularity is well understood. And uh, it's taken a long time, but the general picture that, that has emerged is that um, one has local regularities, one has a well posed system. If the surface tension is positive, or when it's equal to zero, one has to, to make a certain condition, the ready tear condition is satisfied. And the time of existence depends on uh, the natural, two natural uh, feature of the s features of the system. One of these is the smoothness of the parameters. So one would have Z to be smooth and V to be smooth, let's say in some norm. And the other one is what's called uh, the R chord constant of the interface, meaning that this picture is nice, but you could start from a picture of this type at the initial time, and then what would expect that no matter how smooth things are, the time of existence would have to record the fact that if it advanced for too long, it could have created a self-intersection. Uh, self so the time of existence has somehow have to know that uh, one cannot expect to advance, uh, so, so it, depends on, it depends on the fact uh, what's called the R-core constant. The R-core constant is simply the fraction between uh, the chord between these two points and the arc. And when that goes to zero, that will be, that will be a parameter that's small. Um, now, one can also state all these problems. So uh, these problems are stated. Uh, I just drew the picture in, the, in two dimensions. It makes no difference in three dimensions. One can write exactly the same equations in three dimensions. Uh, one can also put periodic conditions. Now, periodic, there are various ways in which you can put periodic conditions. The uh, simplest way, the, the closest to this picture, is to assume a periodic relative to uh, saying that the world is a cylinder. So uh, it would be periodic in the x-axis, but infinite in the vertical axis. So infinite in this direction and periodic in the, uh, in the horizontal direction. One can also put a finite bottom here. Um, and one can also consider a model that I'm going to consider a little later, which is the two fluid model, in which uh, one extends, it's not just one fluid and vacuum, but one would have one fluid and the second fluid on top. And it turns out that there is a reason, it's not just uh, an extension, it's not just an extension, there is a reason to consider the two fluid model at the same time as the one fluid model. And now the local opposite, as I said, is well understood, and it goes back to uh, the earlier work of Nalimov, Yoshihara, Craig. Um, then the local positions in this shape that I wrote here with Sobolev norms and the, the, what we like to think as the natural local positions in Sobolev spaces goes back to the work of CGO from the late 90s. Um, now there are lots of models and uh, uh, there's been a lot of work in, uh, proving this local, proving this local positions theory in uh, all of these models and I, I wrote some names, probably not all of them, and. Uh, I apologize if I missed people. Uh, Bayer Günther, Christodoulou Limblad, Ambrose, Ambrose Masmoudi, Lan, Limblad, Kutan Scholaire, Chen Kutan Scholaire, Christiansen, Hursta Filania, Lazar Borg Julie, Shata Zeng. So I, there, there's been a lot of work on these models, uh, and I stopped at 2011. There's more work after 2011. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, the picture is well understood. Most of the work after 2011 has to do with uh, reducing the regularities. Instead of thinking of the objects being in H10, they would be, let's say, in a lower Sobolev norm. And one could try to reduce the regularity relative to how low one can go. Uh, on the other hand, this is a quasi-linear problem. So one should think that this is a quasi-linear problem. In none of these problems, it's unlikely one can get to the critical regularity by... Uh, it's a quasi-linear problem. So the, uh, it's probably not possible to, to prove well posed as the critical regularity. Um, now, the global regularity results, they are much fewer, and um, they're much more restricted, not only much fewer, but much more restricted. The only time when we know how to prove global regularity uh, is if we have small data. It's the same kind of picture that one has in a quasi-linear problem. So you need to know that you are small or close to some solution that you know. And in this case, you also need the data to be irrotational, so you cannot have any vorticity. And they also need to be in the entire space. We cannot be in a periodic case. So all of the global regularity results, uh, they require these features, smallness, irrotationality, and the domain itself has to be uh, the entire space because that's the only one that uh, would allow. So the, the way the, the mechanism would be is through dispersion, and uh, one can only have dispersion if one is in the full space. And um, it goes, it's also pretty recent, so the first uh, result of this type was an almost global result of CGU from 2009, in which he proved global 
almost global regularity for 2D uh, gravity water waves. Gravity means that uh, gravity, uh, the gravity coefficient is positive, but the surface tension coefficient is zero. Uh, and this was followed by German Masmoudi and Chata in three dimensions, the same problem in three dimensions. One can look at the opposite problem, which one has the capillary water waves, uh, when g is equal to zero and sigma is positive. This is also work of German Masmoudi and Chata. Uh, then afterwards, Fabio Pusateri and I, and at about the same time, Alazar and Delor, we looked at the 2D problem, a 2D gravity problem, and uh, we proved global regularity, so passing from almost global to global. Uh, there are new proofs of this, and also of CGO's result by Hunt and Freeman Tataro, and Freeman Tataro, global regularity. My student Wang, he revisited the problem of global regularity and uh, he showed that uh, one can do global regularity in an infinite energy class, and in that class he can remove one infinite energy, but still small in, a, in, an, in another norm. And in that class he can remove one momentum condition. Uh, now, uh, the opposite problem when one is the capillary, uh, so, so this work with Freeman Tataro, assuming one momentum condition on the Hamiltonian variables, and also Fabio Pusateri and myself uh, without that condition. And there's this last result that uh, uh, Fabio talked about uh, a couple of days ago, in which we, have, we look at the full problem, the G, uh, the, the full problem with both gravity and surface station in three dimensions, that's work with uh, Deng, uh, Posader, and Pusateri. So this is all, uh, this is all by now, I think this is all very well understood. And uh, I only want to make one point about this global regularity work, because I think it's useful for other problems. So if you don't care about water waves, there's still one point that I think uh, is not about water waves, but it's something that we understood very well in the context of water waves. Um, okay, so all of, the, uh, all of the three, all of the results in three dimensions, uh, they go, the mechanism is to prove uh, control of the highest order energy and at the same time prove decay. And it turns out that in this case, one can prove one over T decay. In the cases when G is equal to zero or sigma is equal to zero, one can prove one over T decay for the linearized flow and the hardest part is to prove one over T decay for the nonlinear solutions. And that's the argument that, uh, that's, uh, that, that works in the three dimensional problems. All of them except for the last one, the one that Fabio talked about uh, a couple of days ago. Now, in the two-dimensional problems, there's one uh, idea that developed very well and which got very well understood, uh, which is, um, and which appears in all of the results, starting with CJO's result, uh, which is um, uh, the so-called uh, so quartic energy inequality, which is an inequality that one would like to prove as if the equation was cubic. You'd like to prove that you have an energy inequality, an increment, as if the equation was cubic, uh, because in two dimensions, uh, it becomes a 1D interface, and the best you could hope for is 1 over square root of T decay. And as we know, the 1 over square root of T decay cannot get very far, but if one could, if one could pretend that the equation was cubic, then uh, that would have led to, then in principle, I could have at least gotten the almost global result. And uh, so the mechanism that uh, I think it's kind of a, it's well understood in the context of water waves, and I think it's kind of a general mechanism by now, is to prove uh, this quartic energy inequality, in which the energy is controlled by an integral of four terms, and the point is not to lose the derivative, so th th there are two points in this. Uh, one of them is not to lose the derivative, so to have the same number of the, the highest number of derivatives, not to be different in the, uh, in the right hand side and in the left hand side, and the other one is to get the four terms. Uh, formally, one can think about this as a, as a normal form, but one also has to do it carefully in, in the quasi in the process to make sure not to lose the derivative. And um, this is, uh, as I said, this, uh, this inequality or a form of this inequality is present in all the global results in two dimensions. It goes back to the first work of C.J. Wu. And the, the way uh, one would construct, the, one would solve the problem afterwards is to prove an inequality like that, have one over, one over square root of t point twice decay, that would almost give, uh, that would give the almost global results if it's... Uh, okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind <laughs> invitation to... <laughs> Um, to Bure. Um, okay, so, <laughs> uh, so basically um, what I was saying is that, um, um, so what I was saying is that um, um, if one proves the, the squatic energy inequality and if one can couple this with proving one over square root of T decay, that, that will almost lead to 
uh, that will lead to an almost global solution just out of this uh, just out of this piece. In order to get to the global solution, there's some more Hamilton, there's some more structure in the system that comes from the Hamiltonian structure, and that's what Fabio Pusateri and I found, for example, for the gravity water waves. Uh, there's been a lot of improvements. As I said, this kind of inequality goes back to uh, the work of C.J. Wu, where she, she actually had a logarithmic loss in time uh, in this inequality. It did not affect what she was proving, which was almost global existence, but uh, she did have a logarithmic loss. Fabio and I, we went through her proof and we, it was a removable logarithmic loss. It was not a significant logarithmic loss. Uh, like I said, there were several improvements. Uh, throughout this, uh, the reason why this got well understood, and uh, starting with the, uh, the power differential energy estimates, and we learned this from the work of uh, Alazar and Delors. So, uh, so they they had a certain way, the very nice way to decouple the two issues, which is one of them that you want to have, you want to pretend that the, the equation is cubic. At the same time, you want to make sure you don't lose the derivative, and one can decouple these two issues to address them, to address them. Then what Fabian and I did was to use what we call the compatible vector field structure, which means that we construct a certain, not all vector fields work the same way. It turns out that one cannot quite implement uh, the Kleinman vector field method with all the vector fields counting the same way. Uh, there was the modified energy method of uh, Ephraim and Tataro that uh, clarified, uh, it's, uh, it's the, what, what I really like about that is that uh, it says that if you do a normal form for the purpose of doing an energy estimate, then it's a very good idea to do them together because the normal form is basically a division, the energy estimate is a, it's, it's a symmetrization, and if one does them together, they work very well. They could even simplify a denominator, for example, which is, which is the real concern here. And then um, what, what we did, so we took the point of view that energy estimates is always better to do them in the Fourier space than in the physical space. If uh, it's more flexible in the Fourier space, so we put everything in the Fourier space uh, in the spirit of the I method coming from the semi-linear theory. And in any case, so this, uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because this is the kind of thing that I think is relevant in any problem. So we, we learned, about, we made this work well uh, for waterways, but I kind of feel that this is a general, it's basically a general picture that uh, uh, this, quartic energy, uh, this quartic energy estimate is very robust and I think the only thing that's needed there is not to have small divisors. So in principle, if you have any problem that formally expands in a way that there are no small divisors, then one should expect to be able to, uh, to do a normal form while not losing the derivative, so to prove this quartic energy inequality. Of course, it will fail. The quartic energy inequality will fail if there are small if there are small devices. It's not possible to prove inequality of this type, and this is exactly the issue that uh, Fabio discussed in this last model that Fabio discussed two days ago. Uh, that's exactly the central issue that there is a full set of resonance, so one cannot prove the quartic energy inequality in that case, and also one cannot prove enough decay. The decay. So there's a there's a, the, the, what Fabio described is some kind of a partial normal form that we did that depends on the on a non-degeneracy condition. Um, um, okay, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about the main topic on which I'm going to discuss some proofs, uh, which is formation of singularities. Now, if we think of the local well poisonous theory, the local well poisonous theory says that we have a time of existence that depends on the smoothness of the objects and on the um, on the R chord parameter, which has to do with how far the surface is from self-intersecting. Uh, so there are two possible scenarios in which you could say that you are going to create a singularity. Uh, one of them is to, uh, to uh, find something that leads to loss of regularity, and the other one is to find something that creates a self-intersection. Uh, now, in the loss of regularity scenario, there are also several things we could think. Uh, losing regularity in the middle of the fluid, so in the inside the fluid, appears to be very hard because uh, this is uh, one has less control on this problem than oil, on the Euler equations. There's also the moving the moving interface, so that appears to be uh, a very hard problem. But one could also see the pic one could also try to understand the loss of regularity at the level of the interface. Uh, so the first, what I mean to say is that the loss of regularity problem can be decoupled into something inside the fluid or something uh, on the interface. Uh, now. Um, the I guess like in 2D, you, you don't expect to lose it inside. No, you don't expect to lose it inside, but... Um, well, well, you can say that inside also there is no... You can say that there is no vorticity. You could, you could do other... 
In 2D, in the Euler equation, you lose it because of vortices. You lose it because of vortices. No, the point is comparable. I'm not saying that. Uh, on the other hand, if you can really solve this inside, then you should wonder why can't you do Euler. Um, in any case, so the the two theorems that are uh, there's only one. So basically, the only mechanism that's known that loses regularity and it's proved. Uh, uh, and for which there is a mathematical proof, is this mechanism of the splice singularity, which is drawn here, which says that if we start, if one start, it's possible to start with an interface that's very close to being self-intersecting and uh, smooth. Everything else is smooth except for the fact that it has, uh, it's kind of pinching at a point like that. And uh, um, it's possible to create data that's like that and which advances for a short period of time in a way that it creates the, uh, the self-intersection. And um, this is a very stable phenomenon. This is a singularity discovered a few years ago by Castro, Cordoba, Pfefferman, Gansed and Gomez Serrano. And there, were, there was a new proof of uh, Coutin and Scholaire. It's a very robust phenomenon in certain ways in the sense that uh, um, in the sense that uh, the original proof, for example, was in the gravity problem, but one can put surface tension without changing the conclusion, or I can put, uh, one can put vorticity without changing the conclusion, or I can go from 2D to 3D without changing the conclusion. So it's robust in that sense. Uh, the only thing that prevents uh, this mechanism is what we found a few years later in joint work with Charlie Pfeffman and Victor Lee, uh, which is that if one puts a fluid in the middle, so if one has this picture with one fluid outside and the second fluid, no matter how, uh, no matter how, uh, uh, how light the fluid in the middle is, it's not possible to create a splash while pre preserving things smooth. So, this is, uh, so these, are the two, these are the two themes that are known relative to singularities. And I'm going to describe why is that I think that's relevant. So um, the second term is relevant to the question of producing a singularity through a loss of regularity of the interface. Uh, but let me introduce first the model to make it uh, an exact model. So the model, as I said, for two fluid interfaces is very similar, looks very similar to the model for uh, one fluid, which is what one has two fluids with two different densities and they live in separate, they have to be separate, so there's an interface, there's still an interface. And the fluids are separated and they both evolve according to uh, Euler equations in their respective domains. So one has, uh, one has these equations, this, uh, the material derivatives of U, Uj, so they refer to the fact that there are two U's, there is U1 and U2. And um, they bo both evolve according to, uh, the, according to the Euler equation the, in the respective domains. Uh, the interface itself has to slide, so there is some compatibility condition. The two velocities, they are not independent of each other because the interface itself has to move relative to both fluids simultaneously. And the condition on the interface is that dtz minus each velocity has to be tangent to the uh, has to be tangent to the interface. Uh, the condition here is written in dimension one in which it's a dot product with the, uh, the derivative of d alpha z. And, um, also, the condition of the pressure on the interface becomes the difference of the two pressures, and the, two, the difference of the two pressures would have to be uh, to be proportional to the uh, to the uh, to the curvature of the interface. So this is this is the system. It's a little bit harder to understand that this is a well-posed system. It takes a little bit more effort. Uh, the, for this particular model, uh, the local Wolpozness theory was proved by uh, David Lan to prove that indeed this model is well posed in the sense that if one starts with initial data that's nice, one can extend the solution on a short period of time. And um, so this is the model. Now I'm going to describe first, oh, there's one more. Um, I have one more slide to describe uh, what I, what's, uh, th there's one remaining uh, slight imprecision in these equations, which is the fact that uh, the, it's, it's the choice of the coordinate. So the fact, the, the exact condition is that dtz minus the, some velocity, it has to be tangent to, uh, has to be tangent to the interface. Uh, but exactly what tangent means, it would mean uh, when one can pre one can specify, one can make a more precise condition by saying that dtz is equal to u plus a constant times d alpha z. So this would pick a vector 
in the uh, tangent space. And now this constant can be made to depend on everything. It's a uh, parameterization constant of the interface. Um, and one can take it, uh, in our, one can also not specify it in the sense that any smooth, uh, any smooth uh, function would work the same way. Uh, but the, the two typical coordinates, the Eulerian coordinates, which, which we don't use here, or the Lagrangian coordinates which should be more useful, which one would say that dtz is equal to u. It's exactly equal to u, so the constant be e uh, would be taken equal to zero. So I'm going to quickly describe the construction of the splash um, singularity of uh, Castro, Cordoba, and Pfefferman, uh, Gansed, and Gomez Serrano. Um, just to uh, just to contrast the case of the po the point is to contrast the case of one fluid versus a two fluid problem and to try to understand what is it in the two fluid model that uh, that prevents this and uh, uh, the exact definition so the the, the definition of f of z uh, this is uh, this is the exact definition of uh, the um, R chord constant. It's the picture that I draw here that one looks at. Uh, it's the worst value that one gets by looking at two points alpha and beta and taking the chord and dividing by the length of the arc. And the worst value that one gets relative to the points is called the R chord constant. And um, uh, so the exact theorem of uh, the exact theorem of this uh, of, uh, of these people that I mentioned. Uh, is the following, that if one can look, uh, there is a solution, so there is a periodic solution, it's worked out in the periodic case, but it makes no difference. There is a smooth periodic solution in the gravity, uh, in the gravity problem, so there is a smooth periodic solution. What I have here are the equations written all together, so the first equation is the Euler equation, the second equation uh, is the equation for the interface, uh, the pressure in the case when there is no surface tension is said to be zero, and then uh, the incompressibility and uh, irrotationality conditions in the domain. And uh, there is a solution that uh, either starts out from, so the way it's written, starts out from the arc condition being equal to zero, so it starts from a contact point and it develops uh, in time to uh, to a curve which doesn't have any more contact points. One can also go the other way, so the more, the more natural way would be go to go the other way. One starts with, the, the, the equations are time reversible anyway, so one starts with the picture that's uh, separated and uh, uh, one creates a contact. And uh, I'm going to give a very quick idea about the proof. Uh, the proof is uh, the proof uh, is using, um, it's basically a local well pose. One can reduce the problem to a local well poseness result. And the way to do that is to think of how to express the, um, the velocity in terms of, uh, how to express the velocity in, in a way that accounts for all the conditions. Uh, there are several ways to express it. One can think of it as the gradient of the of velocity potential. One can think of it as a uh, gradient perpendicular of a stream function. Uh, but the way to do it in this problem is to think of the velocity as being the birkhoff roth operator applied to a function omega. And the function omega is thought to be leaving. So the function omega leaves on the interface, the interface uh, vorticity and the Birkhoff rod operator it looks like it's basically an, uh, an integral. It's kind of like a variable coefficient Hilbert transform, in which one it's looking the fraction has in some sense the singularity of a Hilbert transform. We are in one dimension. This is all written in one dimension, and uh, has the singularity of a Hilbert transform. It's integrated against omega, and there's the formula for u. And uh, now. Um, the system can be rewritten in terms of uh, z and omega, so the, the, these two variables, z and omega, they will capture everything. Uh, however, it turns out that uh, the only way you can have a splash, the only way they construct a splash is uh, the function omega going to infinity at the time of the splash. Uh, and the idea that, uh, that, go, that goes in this paper is to make a change of variables. It turns out that the ch a possible change of variables is this tangent of z over 2 that splits the plane. So at the end of it, in the, so after this change of variables, uh, one, has, uh, one has the graph, uh, basically, the, the graph of the change of variables, it will look, um, it, it will, there will not be no splash, it will be, uh, it will look kind of, it will be like a smooth graph. And uh, so they're able to, to make this change of variables and uh, then think about the problem as if it was, 
a local wall poisonous problem. So they start with data that is of this type that would be consistent to the splash, rewrite the equations in terms of these still the variables which are in the in this change of coordinates, and then uh, run the system, so show that the system is well posed for a short period of time, and the short period of time be in such a way that, uh, that this piece is separate from the line, such that after one goes back, uh, one, can get, uh, one can get a separation. So, that's, uh, so one can think about the problem in this way, one can still solve it, the point is one can still solve it by energy estimates after this uh, change of coordinates. Uh, now I'm going to describe now uh, the problem. I'm going to describe now uh, the problem that has to do the two fluid problem. So what do we do in that? What's the difference? Uh, so what, what's the two fluid problem? In the two fluid problem, I want to show exactly that this mechanism doesn't work. The proof itself obviously doesn't work because if there was some fluid in the middle, then making exchange of variables wouldn't be very smooth. So it'll create uh, problems. The change of variable itself would not be uh, would not be you would, one, wouldn't get a, one wouldn't be able to translate this into a smooth problem uh, by, by making this kind of change of error. But the question is, is there something intrinsic or is just that the proof doesn't work? And what we showed is there is something intrinsic. And at the beginning we didn't know, so it started out either way. We didn't know whether it was going to be possible to have a splash or not. Um, so I'm going to state now the precise theorem that uh, we prove in order to explain why is this uh, related to, uh, possibly related to formation of singularity. So the exact term says the following, if we are looking at the solution, so assume that we have a solution of this two fluid system, and I wrote it here, so it's all written uh, in these uh, brackets here. So you have these two fluids with the Euler equations, the equation of motion of the interface, the difference of the pressures, and the divergence, the incompressibility conditions. So assume that we have uh, we have a solution of this, and uh, so I need to describe, make, uh, uh, to describe the precise assumption. So we assume that Z is smooth. So we assume that this interface stays smooth throughout the evolution. And we assume that the velocity on one side stays smooth, just as, if it, just as the problem, uh, just as the, uh, the, the, theorem, the, the theorem for the splash. And then uh, we assume that the time t is equal to zero. The picture is better, so the time t is equal to zero. The, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no contact in, in the interface, and we assume that the time t is equal to zero. Uh, the other fluid is also smooth. But we don't assume anything about the other fluid at any other time, except for time is t is equal to zero. Uh, then the conclusion is that uh, as long as the equations make sense, which means that as long as we don't have, um, as long as we don't have uh, uh, that the, that uh, the function f, as, as long as there is no self-intersection, we have a lower bound for the R chord constant, which means that, um, which means that the interface will not be able to touch. Which means that basically, if, in terms of a co continuity argument, this means that the interface will always have to stay uh, bounded away from from self-intersection. So, in other words, it's not possible to develop. Uh, splash singularities while keeping the interface smooth and one uh, velocity smooth in the case of the two, two fluid interface. Um, now, in order to be able to say that it is not possible to, uh, to, to develop singularity of this type, it's we don't say that it's not possible to create a splash because we it, it's actually likely that if you start, uh, flu fluids do develop singularities. Um, but what the other the other part that's left is that, uh, so the issue, the reason why uh, this mechanism of creating a splash while keeping things smooth is not possible is because the fluid in the middle doesn't have time to get out of the way. As long as the, uh, these uh, two curves are smooth, they will be approaching in a way that's quadratic because there are two curves that approach, uh, that would be approaching. And if they are smooth, then the distance to is between them is too small and the fluid in the middle doesn't have time to get out of the way. A very likely scenario that I think is very possible is that as we approach, so if we start with the picture this way, but at a later time as we approach, uh, it will start creating a corner. You, you can picture that if, it, if it starts creating a corner, then it leaves more time for the, uh, for the fluid in the middle to get out of the way. And I think that's quite possible if we prescribe data uh, that uh, uh, would want to push the fluid in the direction towards self-touching, then 
uh, then the only way that can keep advancing is if it gets uh, sharper and sharper in order to allow for the fluid in the middle to get out of the way, and that hopefully will, uh, that, that could potentially create a singularity, uh, curvature singularity. Um, and now uh, I'm going to describe quickly what's involved in the proof. So, as I said in the beginning, we didn't know which way to go because the, uh, this uh, splash mechanism seems to, be, uh, seems to be robust to almost any other change. Um, and this, it's actually very, very close. It's a log. It's, it's close by a log. Uh, so, I'm going to describe the two main ideas that we have in the proof of this theorem. Um, and um, that, that really two ideas. One of them is dynamical, the other one is at one constant time, so analysis at one constant time. The dynamical part has to do with this boundary vorticity. So if we look at the equations in terms of the boundary vorticity, we can use the birchow roth uh, operator and can express the two vorticities on the two sides in terms of the birchow roth operator of this function omega. And we have this formula as V1 is birchow roth of omega plus omega over 2, and V2 is birchow roth of omega minus omega over 2. And then if we write the two, um, the two uh, equations, so the two Euler equations, get two equations for the, uh, for the velocities. And um, we can take the difference of the two equations. The main difference, the main difference between the two models is on this slide. Uh, we can take the difference of the two equations, then we get the Burgers-like equation. And the Burgers equation is something of the form dt omega is equal to one half d alpha omega squared plus some kind of multiples of d alpha f omega and, and uh, some, some simpler terms. And now we can think about this as a Burgers equation. And for the Burgers equation, uh, we can preserve, the strongest norm we can preserve for omega is the L infinity norm. So everything is to be thought of as local. But what we can preserve, because we have this Burgers equation, we assume that these functions f1 and f2 are smooth as part of the assumptions for the theorem, uh, then, we, then we get that this, uh, Burgers, uh, that this boundary vorticity would have to stay bounded over the time of the evolution. And this is the, so this is the, the piece that makes a difference relative to the, uh, to the case when there is only one fluid. Um, and now, once we know this information that, uh, that the boundary vorticity stays uh, bound, the, the, the boundary vorticity stays bounded, uh, what we want to say is that if we have, that if the, if we have a situation in which we have two points, so let me draw it like that. If we have two points in which, so this would be the points uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2. So if we have two points uh, in which the distance between them is small, then we want to be able to say that uh, the, distance, the difference between the normal velocities at those points would have to be small and small by, uh, with the same constant. So if the distance is smaller than epsilon, then the difference between the, uh, vortices, the, the velocities have to be smaller than epsilon. Turns out that we lose a log of 1 over epsilon that has to do with the fact that all of these uh, operators are essentially, um, they are essentially Hilbert transform. At best, they are Hilbert transform. They, in fact, come some kind of variable coefficient Hilbert transforms. And we have to work on L infinity because that's the best information that we have about the boundary vorticity. So that, that leads to a logarithmic uh, a loss of log of 1 over epsilon. And um, the proof goes in the following way. So we are looking at um, so, uh, what is the information in the problem? So, you are looking at uh, these operators, but maybe I should start from here. So, the information in the problem is the smoothness. And the smoothness, um, we can draw this picture. So, let me draw this picture separately. So, we, so we have two curves described by the functions f and g that are supposedly smooth. And uh, we have these operators t1 f of omega plus omega plus has to do with one side. So this would be the things with plus live on the upside on the side on top, and the things with minus live on the side on the bottom, let's say. So on the top we have this omega plus, and we have uh, the function f, and we have uh, uh, so that uh, and we have the um, the velocity. So this so f plus plays the role of the velocity, so we obtain the velocity out of the uh, so this Hilbert transforms, this operators T1 and T3, they are uh, written on this slide and they are essentially the, uh, the normalized versions of the uh, birchow roth operator I had earlier. So the birchow roth operator, if we write it in this picture in which we uh, let, uh, uh, in which we so expand the picture, so we have these functions f and g that correspond to these two 
sides of the curve. And uh, also you have to localize them properly. So if the distance here is epsilon, uh, then it turns out we have to take out uh, a distance in the horizontal direction of size square root of epsilon. So we take out the essential parts of the, uh, of the birkhoff roth operators and we write them, so we write these operators that uh, are the parts of the birkhoff roth operators uh, after these normalizations. And the system that, so the information that we get is uh, contained in the first two lines. So f plus is one velocity and f plus is a formula in terms of omega plus in terms of, in terms of omega minus. And f minus also has, the same, has a similar formula. And the function g is what measures the, uh, is what measures the difference between the two, uh, the two velocities that we want to show that is smaller than epsilon log of one over epsilon. So the harmonic analysis problem, if you want, becomes so after this uh, reduction, it becomes that we have, we know that the functions omega plus and omega minus, uh, they are bounded. This is coming from the uh, dynamical part of the problem. Now we fix the time t. We, we just have to produce a fixed time t, but we have this dynamical information that omega plus and omega minus are bounded. And we know that the functions f and g are smooth, suitably smooth. And we know that functions, what's more important is we know that functions f plus and f minus, uh, they are smooth as well. And out of this, we want to derive the fact that uh, this function g is small, g of zero is small. And um, it's like we like to, uh, the problem, the difficulty is the fact that the information we got about omegas is coming from the Burgers equation. When you do the Burgers equation, you cannot get information about the derivatives. You are going to get information about the functions, some, but, but it's not possible to get information about the derivatives. So we don't have good information about the derivatives. Other, we, we only know the L infinity norm about these vorticities. So we have to run an argument according to these L infinity norms. And we use, um, so to, to prove this proposition, we use uh, what we call the Z norm method, in which we define a norm. We use this also in other problems that have to do with global regularity, but we have to define a norm that's uh, consistent with the problem. And you have to analyze uh, this system in a bootstrap way in terms of this norm. In our case, the norm that we define, it's basically a Hilbert transform. It's, uh, so these are, these are essentially Hilbert transforms that we are looking at. But um, they're also, they're, they're, they're not exactly, uh, uh, they, they are variable coefficient Hilbert transforms, coefficients that depend on these other functions f and g. So the, the function that we have here is a certain type of Hilbert transform. And they are looking, so we measure a function, um, so we measure a function by testing against, uh, by, by essentially calculating its Hilbert transform and then uh, measuring it in a proper space. It's written here as uh, uh, in a duality way. And then um, it turns out uh, it's very important to get the cons to get the bound on G to be epsilon log of one over epsilon. You cannot lose more than log of one over epsilon. If it was like epsilon to the one half, then that would not have prevented a splash. It has to be uh, epsilon and the most we can lose is, is log of 1 over epsilon. It turns out it's quite, uh, uh, we are quite surprised that in fact it turns out we get it exactly, uh, so we get this exactly, uh, so we can close the argument to prove this, uh, to, to prove this. And um, I only have um, five more minutes. I wanted to say a few words about why is it that uh, we are looking at this model. So uh, my hope is that um, now, we don't have a theorem, but uh, we have uh, tried a few things. The hope would be to try to create, uh, like I said, a splash of this type. So, uh, I'm sorry, what the hope would be to try to look at um, an evolution that creates both a splash and a singularity at the same time. So, what one would like to see dynamically is that as the interface starts approaching towards uh, splashing, it would also have to create a corner. And that's, um, um, now that's, that seems to be pretty tough, so we have some work in progress. Um, one, one feature of this model that, um, that I like, which is better than other models, one could ask the same question for other models, you can ask the same question for SQG, for example. Like why you can put any equations here and ask this question, can you form a singularity in the interface? Uh, one feature of this model is that in some sense there is no place it can go. So if, if it advances, 
what we sh what we show to this theorem is that if, if the interface wants to, it's also possible to create symmet a symmetric picture. So one can have everything symmetric relative to an axis. And if we can get it to advance, uh, then the only way uh, the only way the evolution will finish is by creating a curvature singularity, because otherwise so you would uh, otherwise you would violate this theorem. Otherwise it would create a splash without forming the singularity. So that's uh, now, of course, the difficulty. What, what's hard and haven't been able to do is to control the flow. One needs to control. One needs to be able to say that this interface advances for long enough and it gets start to control the flow um, as you lose smoothness. So the more smoothness you lose, the uh, it's a quasi-linear problem. So it's hard to control the flow. One has to use energy, isn't it? but at the same time control the flow. So in any case, so we don't have uh, we don't have a very clear we don't have theorem we don't have a theorem of this type, but um, I think this would be something that that would be very interesting for this, and it's the kind of thing that one can only one can do it for this model. One might not be able to do it for the uh, for the model in which one has only one fluid. We know that the splash can be created by without uh, without losing smoothness. So it's not possible to have this mechanism there. Um, okay, so I'm I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Cool. Other questions? So, is it possible to try and solve backwards from the corner situation? Uh, yeah, if we could find a good answer uh, to. Um, um, it's possible. It's not so easy to do it, but it's possible. I mean, of course, that's how uh, that's how the theorem for the splash was proved by solving backwards. Now one can now there are more proofs, but uh, the original proof was by solving backwards. Uh, it's pretty important how you make the answer. It's, it's I, I think it's pretty delicate. I think it's pretty delicate to do it this way. But uh, yeah, it's certainly possible. I think that's a very nice idea, and uh, your picture is, I would like to modify to make it a self-similar corner, and then solve backwards. So what would happen in self-similar variables? Make a very symmetric corner touching, and then solve to separate. Yeah, if I could, yeah, I'd love to be able to tell you. <laughs> it's uh, the kind of, uh, there are several things. Ultimately, my feeling is that the only way you can really do this is through some sort of monotonicity. Because it, if you start lose, if you try to solve the equation as if it was a well-posed problem, I don't think that's. I, I'm not sure this can be made to work. It's uh, it is, at the end of the day, this way you can say that the problem is well-posed in some coordinates. But uh, what sometimes works better is if you have some sort of monotonicity, which we are working on understanding. I do have another question, if, if you permit me, sure. which is, um, I know it looks very different, but it does nonetheless remind me of, uh, of uh, Cordoba de la Llave Pfefferman squirt singularities. That is, these interfaces are approaching each other, and they are smooth, you assume, so it's pushing the interior fluid rapidly. And so the squirt singularities avoid a, 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 that situation by the time integral of the L infinity norm of the velocity. You're studying something else, but is that ge uh, geometric configuration forcing, say, the vorticity to infinity? It's just, it's almost a geometrical picture. It's making the interior fluid, the, the lighter fluid as you've drawn it, move fast near the boundary walls, and so omega is getting larger. It's not the only scenario that can happen. So this is my hope, because I, I like to prove uh, lots of regularity of the interface. This is not the only scenario. In fact, Charlie Pfefferman and I, we had lots of discussions. He, he feels that things will happen differently, maybe according to what you say. Um, my feeling is that if you set up this, the velocity to be high enough, you can set up the data, the velocity to be high enough, there is no time for it to develop something so complicated. It just wants to form a corner for the thing in the middle to get out of the way. Now, that's my feeling. Of course, uh, uh, this is not a proof. So there, there are no proofs in this uh, formation of uh, curvature singularities. 
But uh, Ch I think Charlie is. So I, I had a lot of lots of discussion with Charlie Fairman about this, and we could never really see exactly one reason why one is more likely than the other. Okay, thank you. Thank you.